the issue of, of security policy has become, at least since 2014, much more relevant to the political debate within Europe. Um, to use a euphemism, because the political environment, the, the security environment around or outside the EU has become more dynamic. This is why we've already, uh, in our common cooperation with ECFR, have uh, led a row of, of debates on this issue. A couple of years ago, it was uh, solely focused on the US and the implications uh, after the election of Donald Trump uh, on European policy. Last year, we were talking about European de uh, defense cooperation. Um, and today, we had a debate already this morning on uh, the Trump factor within the European security policy. Um, it's very important that we're talking here today. I, would, I don't think I will betray our uh, rules of, this, uh, of the debate this morning when I'm telling that one uh, result of the debate was that we have to include the public into the debate about policy, uh, about security policy, especially when we have different viewpoints uh, in Poland, in Germany, and uh, uh, in Central Europe. So um, that's what we, were, uh, what we are striving to do as Konrad Adenauer Foundation, to contribute to a common uh, understanding of each other's viewpoints. And that's why I'm very glad to have this debate, especially now. Um, you will talk more about the political context that we're in, and you will also introduce the guests. So I will hand over the microphone and wish you all a very inf informative and uh, exciting debate. Yes, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, and I will switch into Polish now. Um, we will have a Polish-English conversation here on the, on the stage. Szanowni Państwo, uh... Ladies and gentlemen, welcome very warmly. I'm really glad that so many of you could uh, make it today. This topic is uh, very uh, crucial and it's become truism to say that after the period of dividend of peace, uh, post-1989, we entered the era which is no longer the end of history. In the past, we said that we live in different times, uh, in times of uh, lack of security. There is no longer a bipolar world, and this has lots of uh, consequences. This is not only specific to our region, to Central Eastern Europe, but this is a general tendency. But particularly in this uh, region, the region that we uh, are in, we are interested in having a look at uh, matters of security and it's become a challenge uh, for political elites and the society uh, to have a look at these uh, things. Dangers to security result in the first place from the politics of Russia. We've had lots of proofs in the past years uh, that Russia uh, very openly infringes uh, upon uh, peaceful rules uh, all over the world and it is uh, expanding its military capabilities in a way that uh, uh, makes us uh, fear what uh, the future will bring. Europe, uh, Central Eastern Europe, has become a place uh, where the interests of the West uh, and of the East uh, clash. And Russia seems to be the main source of threat. But I would also say that the feeling of uh, lack of security results also from the fact uh, that uh, frameworks, uh, alliances uh, that uh, used to ensure peace in Europe and all over the, the world no longer perform this function. And the politics of uh, Donald Trump, the new American administration, is in many countries a source of the lack of confidence in the situation as far as uh, um, defense and security policy is concerned. When we have a look at uh, steps taken uh, in the foreign policy of Donald Trump, for instance, uh, withdrawal uh, from agreement with uh, Iran and other bilateral, multilateral agreements, uh, uh, withdrawal from Syria, these are situations which lead to 
the fact that we are no longer sure what the next steps of Trump administrations will be. On the other hand, uh, America has become much more engaged from military perspective in Europe. It has uh, uh, spent it has spent more money on deterrence. Uh, so we've got mixed feelings as to the situation in Europe and all over the world is concerned. The question is how this new order, world order, so on the one hand uh, aggression uh, of Russia and on the other hand uh, the attitude of the United States. This questions this question is something that we deal with uh, at uh, the ECFR. We published a report on uh, Polish-German uh, uh, relations uh, uh, in this topic, as well as a report on INF, uh, um, which uh, has been drafted by uh, Gustav uh, Gressel, who is sitting next to me. And the question that we would like to uh, touch upon today is uh, how uh, these uh, this insecurity should be addressed at the European level because it seems uh, that uh, the threats and dangers uh, bring about different results in our countries. Uh, maybe Poland and Germany are particularly uh, interesting and important when it comes to these differences. Of course, we should not uh, overestimate uh, this, mm, all these differences. But on the other hand, they should not be underestimated as well. And for sure, we should talk about them as much as possible. And that's why we uh, are uh, we gathered here. And let me now welcome our uh, panelists. Uh, first of all, uh, Bartosz Cichocki, Under Secretary of State in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Poland. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, Ambassador of Germany to uh, Poland, uh, Rolf uh, Nickel. Welcome. It's great pleasure and great honor to have you with us. Irina Kaljurant, a counselor in the planning department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Estonia. That's her current position, but uh, uh, she ha uh, headed a Leonard Tallinn uh, conference in Tallinn. And last but not least, uh, Gustav Gressel, um, senior policy uh, fellow ICF. Are welcome. Thank you for this uh, applause. And let me now start a debate with the following question addressed to Mr. Chichotsky and then to the other panelists as well. The question is about the balance of current uh, policy of Donald Trump towards Europe and particularly Central Eastern Europe. I talked about uh, insecurity coming from two uh, sides, from the West and from the East. On the one hand, we've got uh, steps taken by Donald Trump, which make us feel insecure. But on the other hand, uh, we uh, can see that uh, he's uh, in expanding his military capabilities in Europe. He's um, extending financing in Europe. So these are kind of contradictory symptoms. So my question seems to be easy, but the, qu the answer to this question might not be that easy. Are we more or less secure having Donald Trump uh, with us in Central Eastern Europe? Uh, thank you. Not much to add after this uh, introduction. First of all, thank you for uh, inviting me. I would also like to extend my thanks to Konrad Adenauer Foundation as well as the European Council of Foreign Relations that's always very interesting and challenging uh, to face uh, such a distinguished audience and to be able to confront uh, uh, views and answer any questions uh, that might be asked. We are less and less secure and the source of this situation is uh, um, the um, defense policy and the policy of Russia. Uh, Trump is answering, responding to 
the changing situation and the steps taken by Russia against uh, international treaty, treaties, against some basic fundamental rules uh, uh, that also Russia should abide by, uh, the readiness uh, to use military force uh, to uh, resolve conflicts, uh, annexations, um, um, the attack on Ukrainian vessels in the Black Sea, imprisonment uh, of uh, um, Ukrainians uh, at the vessels. This is the description of the current uh, uh, security situation in uh, Europe. The Russian concept of the division of Europe into two zones, a zone of uh, direct influences, this is Belarus, Ukraine, and then a zone that I would call blocking package in Central uh, Europe, uh, Baltic republics as well, where Russia would like to co-decide, uh, that Russia would like to uh, take part in decision-making process and the readiness to use military power to implement these rules. This is why we are less and less secure and we need to draw conclusions from the fact that Russia in a relatively short period of time expanded its uh, military potential that is way beyond its uh, needs and it leads to a situation where Russia is able to perform a high intensity uh, operation in any uh, region of the world. Uh, Donald Trump and uh, North Atlantic ally, uh, allies. This is the other part of the problem. Uh, well, some time ago we started a process of adopting NATO to the changing situation and today the situation is much better than uh, three years ago, than before the summit in Newport. We've got the uh, IFPs. Uh, with troops uh, um, not only from the United States but also from Germany, from Canada, from France. We've got a uh, unanimous demonstration uh, of unity. Uh, we've got lots of exercises taking p place uh, there uh, on a regular basis process of reform to uh, commanding forces is also ongoing. Uh, after the end of uh, Cold War we reduced uh, um, the troops uh, and now we need to expand them in line with the challenges ahead of us. So we are on a good way uh, uh, to achieve our goals and this is the positive element in this balance uh, of the current situation and the role of the United States is still um, the leading one. Some say that uh, the United States regained uh, the steering wheel. Of course there are some controversies. We need to build consensus over a long period of time and we need a strong arm and we need to reverse a tendency uh, which took place some time ago to decrease spending on military uh, forces. We need to reverse this tendency right now. We are also building or consolidating um, our position around a series of other problems that are undermining our security situation and this refers to uh, the European dimension, migration, influx of uh, refugees from outside Europe. The situation right now is much better from the perspective of politics and uh, military aspects than we were in three years ago. Uh, the security of uh, Central Eastern Europe is also influenced by Brexit and um, the form that Brexit uh, will take and the consequences, the, uh, the, um, the consequences of Brexit for the situation, the implications of uh, Brexit, uh, Treaty of uh, Aquis Gran is also of, uh, of Ar uh, and on a higher level, situation 
of security in Europe can be described by the risk that a crisis of elites will take place in Europe. Elites might lose uh, their power, their legitimation in a very turbulent way and if that happens, Brexit will be just an onset, uh, just the beginning of a serious uh, problem. As we can uh, see, having a look at uh, results of elections in a number of European states, uh, the essence of European integration is uh, being undermined And all these questions are crucial to us. So the situation is um, neither good nor bad. It all depends uh, on the perspective that we take. Uh, there has been some progress, but on the other hand, uh, uh, there have been some negative uh, developments. Uh, we are in the process of a discussion with our allies from uh, Sweden, from Germany, from a range of other countries. And I hope that our situation will be getting better and better. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, Bartosz Cichocki talked about the fact that it's not the politics of Trump that is uh, the main source of insecurity in our region. Minister Maas, Ministry of, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Germany, talked some time ago about the fact that the change that we can observe in the American politics right now relies in the following. We cannot assume that we will be consulted when decisions will be taken. Trump is no longer a leader of a liberal world and our response should be to be a sovereign, uh, united Europe. What's the challenge ahead of uh, European states? How can we find unity in facing Trump and other problems? Well, f first of all, thank you very much also for inviting me and thank you for the organizations uh, for organizing this, this very interesting and timely debate. Uh, I would say I, I agree uh, broadly with, uh, with what uh, uh, Bartosz Szychocki has said, uh, specifically about the major threat that, that, that we're facing and this is the threat of Russian revisionism, let's face it, and let's name it clear, clearly. Um, the other things uh, I will talk later, but clearly Russia has, by the way it has acted in the last couple of years, created lots of problems in terms of security. They have uh, violated uh, the uh, INF Treaty. They have put SS-26 into Kaliningrad. Uh, there is the Skripal affair. There are cyber attacks that there are interference in the, inter in the elections in a number of countries, including uh, in Germany. So um, it's quite clear that the main danger for security in Europe comes from Russia and we should not turn around the pie in this respect. Um, it is also true that the geopolitical role of the US is changing. Um, and that's not only because of Mr. Trump. I would say Mr. Trump is rather the symptom uh, than the origin of what, we, what we're seeing. I mean, the pivot to Asia is something that already we saw under, under Obama. Neo-isolationist tendencies are always more or less present in US, in US politics. Um, and certainly, let's not exaggerate. Leaders in one place or another come and go, and that's not, the Atlantic doesn't get wider for that, and interests, uh, are per, interests of states are much more perennial than personalities. There's also a new factor, I would say, uh, 
which is and, and you talked about a little, a little in the in the beginning i think the new phenomenon that we see these days and that's part of the danger for europe is that we see great power competition again clearly and this is not only great power competition with Russia, which is essentially security, but it's also great power competition with, with China. And China is more, is more technologically, is more economic. And, uh, and the US, of course, as a, as a global power, has other fish to fry as well than, than Europe. And that's part of the problem we have in Europe. We have to be aware of the fact, and that comes, now comes what, what you're saying, that we are in the that we must see to it that we can not always influence the way uh, the the U.S. policy has been done before, and also there is this notion in the in the U.S. that that alliances are maybe not as important uh, as in the in the past, and uh, there may be uh, th there may be uh, problems associated with this transactional nature of politics, which is I think. Uh, dangerous and we can get into that debate more uh, deep, deep more deeply later on maybe um, so I would say that yes the, the part the in conclusion I would say that the, this problem we have in, in in Europe is a problem of Russia essentially of Russian revisionism it is complicated by a changing geopolitical role of, of the US and it's complicated by great, great power competition. Uh, Serena, uh, you, you worked at the policy planning of the uh, Estonian MFA. And Estonia is a, a quite exceptional country uh, for, for various, of course, for various reasons. But uh, one of them is that it's um, apparently it manages to strike a balance between its uh, very strong Atlanticist uh, orientation uh, and at the same time is um, an active part of the European efforts uh, to um, forge a uh, European um, strategic autonomy um, as part of the European intervention initiative um, in, in, how, w what these, what these dilemmas look like from the Estonian uh, perspective? Could you say a few words about that? Thank you very much, Piotr, and thank you for your invitation, and also Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Indeed, as a small country um, and the frontline state uh, along the Russian border, um, it has been very important for us to get sort of integrated into all these Western European institutions to to keep our region or our country stable and secure. And, uh, and I mean, this is like a burden of a small country that you have to, um, you, you have to, you're like squeezed in between all these different discourses and initiatives and, and everything. And either you have to go with the flow or you will die. So we, I, this has been our long-term policy, actually, to get as integrated into all these Western institutions as possible. And, uh, and maybe uh, with President Trump being elected, uh, the, the most or sort of difficult problem for us is that uh, exactly, at it has been pointed out several times before, that, um, that it we, we see the return of great power politics, uh, that these institutions and multilateralism as such do not matter anymore. These are like, a, we are like a conglomerate uh, beside China, Russia, India, um, US and, and other raising powers in, in, in Asia, but also in the Middle East. So this is difficult to, uh, to observe that the EU is becoming a little bit peripheral in, in this sense, like, like a geopolitical power. Um, and we also see a sort of unilateralism um, emerging from US actions, uh, like withdrawing from INF and all this struggle about free trade agreements and, and the GP, uh, 
GPSOE and, uh, and other agreements. And this is, uh, this is indeed something new, I think, that all great powers uh, have to deal with. And Russia, of course, takes advantage of all these uh, weaknesses and, and all these disagreements and, and deviations within the alliance and, and the union. So um, I think that when, when we very often seem to, to blame Russia for, for everything and, and we also sometimes say that, that um, maybe Trump being elected was a very favorable thing for Russia, then actually I, I tend to agree with those analysts who say that, um, that it is not actually the Trump's Russia politics that is favorable to Russia. It is mainly what Trump has done to the US image and the image of liberal democracies that is favorable to Russia and that actually gives Russia an opportunity to uh, to play us against each other. Yeah, thank you very much, Rina. And uh, um, I would like to turn to, to Gustav now, and uh, we, because uh, um, if you want to comment on anything you have heard here, uh, please feel free to, to do so. But um, you have already, all of you have already mentioned INF Treaty many times, and I, I have the feeling that uh, this is a, a, a new... Uh, I don't want to say battle, but a new discussion which we will be facing in the upcoming weeks. Uh, the U.S. is expected to withdraw from this very important treaty forbidding the medium-range missiles uh, on the European soil. Um, it, it, it is in reaction on the violations of the of the treaty by Russia, clearly. But um, the discussion we should expect in the upcoming weeks is what next? I mean, do we need uh, more uh, troops? Do we need more uh, missiles? Do we need more arms in our part of Europe? Or do we need more efforts to um, ensure a better arms control? Uh, the, I, I have the feeling that the ideas are, are, are multiple, uh, but, but they are, um, uh, to a large extent, um, Mm, uh, divisive, or 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 at least um, not all of them can be implemented mm, at the same time. So the the question for for Gustav, who uh, wrote this ECFR paper on the on arm con control, including the INF treaty, is is it really the 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 next uh, big issue which can potentially divide us in Central Europe? Unfortunately, it could be. I mean, the, what, what I wanted to comment on the last thing actually fits perfectly to the INF saga because as the INF saga unfolded, it became unfortunately symptomatic for for the current shape of, of US politics. Um, there are different foreign policies. There is the foreign policy of the foreign policy establishment of Congress, Senate, uh, uh, sort of the old folks in the State Department and the DOD. Uh, there, there is sort of the, the foreign policy of the U.S. administration, so the ministers, especially the former uh, national security advisor uh, and, the for and the former Ministry of Defense and the former Secretary of State, and then there's Trump. And they seem to perfectly contradict each other at some times. Like, uh, the Ministry of Defense indeed did a good job, and this was cited before, uh, Congress did a good job on sanctions on Russia, which are targeted. The problem is that, for example, Trump diluted them for one of his pals, uh, or the pals of one of his pals, uh, then Oleg Deripaska, where, where, where sort of that undermined a lot of the credibility of U.S. sanctions. If you, if you then exempt those people who are actually hurt by them uh, by, by by special um, sort of uh, special amendments, and then uh, handing over Syria to Russia, it was of course something that undercut predictability and and uh, uh, the, the sort of the increasing lack of liaison between between some European powers and and uh, America like for example the Normandy format uh, most of most of the people perceive that as a German French shop to talk with the Russians uh, and a bit of the Ukrainians but the Normandy format would have never worked if it were not for tacit American support for it and if 
if if sort of Merkel raises the finger to the Russians and says you should do that and that and that and listen to that, then this would only be listened to by Putin because Putin knows that there is or there was Biden and Obama in the back that would back her up on whatever she threatened, um, which is not now the case. And without American support, actually, the Russians have no inclination to listen to anything because they don't care. Um, s s said that, uh, or let, let us go to the INF thing. I mean, the, the sort of the, the McMaster math is way forward. Uh, Sort of the situation that Russia breached the INF on, on various systems is clear. Um, so how to move forward? The problem is we don't have another missile like it, in the old missile crisis to threaten Russia. If you don't comply, we will get whiny on you um, because there is no counter missile. So let's develop a counter missile, then talk to the Russians that if you don't mess up, we will, we will make the situation more messy for you and you will be at the bad end of an arms race you can't win. And in the meantime, the time we have till then, we start to prepare our own public uh, for the battle ahead. Because with Russia, we are not only at a sort of uh, tense situation on the eastern flank, we are also at information war. And in an information war, you need to take command and initiative of the narrative and never leave the narrative at your enemy. Uh, and sort of Trump crisscrossed that unilaterally by withdrawing quite ahead of time. So we don't have a counter missile, we haven't yet prepared our populations, and we haven't now been com in command of the narrative. Uh, the sort of the, the, the NATO summit then reinstated uh, the, this, this sort of ultimatum time was the attempt to regain control of the narrative and say, look, we are fed up with Russian non-compliance um, and to, to, to give some time and to, to send a clear signal to your own public that, look, this is what you have to prepare for. Um, in, in, in that sense, to be honest, uh, I think this uh, much of much of this sort of debate whether America is going away from Europe is a bit hypothetical because actually now under Trump, uh, America is like any other typical European country. It's highly divided. It has sort of a completely polarized society, a dysfunctional foreign policy apparatus. So if you come from Central Europe, you know you suddenly start to understand this country. The problem is we depend on it. We don't depend for like Austria or some other state for security or even Berlin. Um, we 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 depend on the US, and now they're like us, which is not not reassuring. Thanks. Uh, Ambassador Nickel, let us dive into the uh, the INF uh, thing a bit, uh, bit deeper. You, you are an expert on, on uh, disarmament, uh, arm, arm control, and um, uh, clearly the the prehistory of the INF treaty is uh, strongly related to the German history and the the uh, NATO rearmament decision in the late 70s uh, provoked lots of discussions and divisions uh, in Germany. Are you expecting anything like this happening again once the INF treaty uh, is declared dead? It's probably, it, it is already dead, but it, it will be declared dead in a few days. And uh, there will be certainly uh, voices in Europe which would encourage uh, the US, the Germans, French, and others to um, strengthen uh, the military capabilities mm, in order to uh, restore the balance between Russia on the one hand and the Western alliance on the other. So how, how do you envisage this discussion to develop in the upcoming weeks and months? Well, first of all, thank you very much for referring to my not so distant past. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I was uh, Federal Commissioner for Arms Control and Disarmament uh, before I came uh, to, to Warsaw as, as ambassador. So, INF, uh, <laughs> I've, I've seen it, I've seen the Russian non-compliance from the beginning. Uh, we discussed this uh, already in, in 2013, uh, when there were the first signs uh, that, that Russia was developing this new uh, SSCH. Uh, which is uh, which is a cruise missile and which is certainly uh, not in line with uh, the INF treaty. So uh, it's clear and uh, 
Maas, Mr. Maas has said this very clearly when he was in Moscow last Friday, that the ball is squarely in the Russian court. They must come clean and the SSCH must be verifiably, and I insist on verifiably, because it's very important in arms control, not only reducing arms, but we do this verifiably. So it must be verifiably disarmed. This is, I think, the basis. And all of us, and I think all of the countries sitting around this table, are very, very clear on this, also in the, in the NATO context. They cannot be pitting anybody uh, any ally against other allies in, in this respect. Russia has violated, Russia has to come clean, Russia has to, has to, has to, dis, uh, to verifiably disarm this, this. This is the first thing. Secondly, the fact that, that we are discussing this and the fact that on February 2nd, uh, the period of 60 days expires, does not mean that, this, that Russia can continue to, to implement this. Yeah? It's, not, it's not that uh, the sword is falling down on the 2nd of February and everything is finished. So, so the, the ball is still in, in, in Russia's court even after f February 2nd. Third point. We are now no longer in the 80s. In the 80s, we had, we had this traditional uh, situation. We had a we had uh, the Russia uh, uh, having the, uh, the SS uh, having having their weapons, and and we decided by this f famous double track decision to go against it, and we in the end succeeded in disarming both categories on the Russian side and on the and on the alliance side. But today, arms control is much more complicated. Arms control is about new hypersonic. Uh, we uh, weapons. It's uh, not conventional hypersonic weapons. It's about uh, it's about uh, um, space-based uh, assets. It's about uh, cyber. It's about a whole new ca whole new categories of uh, of arms control. And that's why one should not just say now that we that we need to rearm in order in order to to face to face this new this new danger. In fact, even even today, I mean, with the the INF is only land-based uh, land-based missiles. We are having a lots of, we're having lots of airborne and sea-based uh, uh, components, which are very very strong and are also less destabilizing and more secure in case uh, in case of a, in case of a first a first attack. So let's be let's be serious. Let's not let's not talk about things uh, before they are in front of us here. Let's try to let's still try to to save this this treaty. It may be very very difficult, and then and then we shall see. And let's keep let's keep the the alliance united. Let's not be let's not be divided by by expert talks in which in which uh, Russia sort of uh, seems to show that. Um, uh, the, the weapon you, you can you can see it you can touch it but of course if you if you see it and touch it you don't know how long it can how long it can fly so uh, I think this is this is a very complicated debate which we should seriously uh, discuss and not jump uh, too easily uh, to conclusions uh, which are uh, inappropriate as we speak now. Panie ministrze, uh, Minister, Ambassador Nicol talked about the fact that we need to try and save uh, the INF Treaty and we should not jump at conclusions. Uh, do you think that it is possible to save the treaty? And if not, uh, what uh, possibilities uh, can you see? in the area of uh, armament or disarmament in Europe? Well, not much to add uh, after what uh, the previous uh, speakers uh, contributed to the debate. It is possible to save the treaty, but we need to understand that on the 2nd of February, uh, the US, uh, unless uh, Russia uh, rejoins the treaty, uh, the UN will uh, uh, suspend uh, the implementation of the treaty, but the treaty will 
still be there and it will be possible for Russia uh, to be a member of the treaty again. That's one thing. Secondly, I should start uh, with saying that I can agree with the fact that it's not, not as bad as people uh, say and claim. I think that uh, the reality is not um, that bad because the ministers of foreign affairs uh, of NATO in December took adopted a common position, which is good. We need to retain unity to uh, put uh, Russia under pressure to rejoin the treaty because it's uh, Russia um, who uh, is not acting in line with the treaty and not the United States. We need. Uh, common foundations, common basis uh, to act uh, against uh, Russia and really it's not that bad. Public debate uh, um, make us uh, see these things uh, in a light uh, that is not uh, true. Well, we've got also a New START treaty and it is not being assessed in a very negative way. It is a very crucial treaty. But I can agree that in the past 20 years, totally new systems emerged and we know that a range of other systems will be established, will be developed. Uh, countries em emerged that uh, never were parties, uh, never were parts of any uh, regimes or allies, uh, alliances, if Russia does not come back to the treaty, then first of all, us in Europe, well, we have not developed and we are not ready to develop a system that would be a military response to SSC-8 uh, system. And uh, it was interesting what Mr. Gressel said that we were trying to convince uh, our societies uh, that as long as INF is there, we are safe, although uh, the INF treaty uh, has been breached uh, for many years now and we've had plenty of time to build a response uh, uh, to the situation, but we should not initiate uh, any talks on uh, new regime with uh, Russia uh, until it uh, becomes a member of uh, the treaty again and until it is it becomes compliant with the treaty again. In Poland, we would expect that the United States, the only state which is uh, which has the potential to do so, will start to take military action to uh, address uh, the actions taken by Russia. And these measures uh, need, do not need to include Europe. Uh, but of course it will have influence on the security in Europe. This is what I would like to emphasize. Uh, this has been already mentioned by uh, Professor uh, Gressel and Nickel, but I think it's really crucial. As about, um, how the whole INF debate uh, is viewed in, in Estonia and to what extent uh, the possible withdrawal is seen as a risk for also for Estonian uh, security. I, I would like to... Uh, um, um, ask uh, uh, Gustav for a short explanation because uh, here we we have heard two words of uh, caution uh, but in your uh, in your paper you basically uh, the title of your paper is rearmament for for arms control with the with the uh, the main argument is that uh, in order to make Russia to comply with the international agreements we need to basically restore the military balance because that would not work otherwise. Could you spend two minutes on on explaining the, this uh, this way of thinking? So, in 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 the Soviet Union, uh, arms control had two purposes: uh, first, to curb technological or military advantages of the West, and second, to make an impression on the progressive camp in in the West. 
uh, an arms control proposal had to fulfill both or or at least one of them. Uh, Russia or the Soviet Union signed the INF Treaty and the CFE Treaty and the Open Sky Treaty not because uh, it liked us or there was a lot of trust, but because it perceived itself in an arms race, both in a nuclear di di uh, dimension and in a conventional dimension, it was about to lose and it couldn't afford to continue. And it was a way out of that. Uh, we can even see now the non-compliance of Russia, and it's not only the INF Treaty. Uh, it's basically any arms control treaty and convention that we have in Europe, that Russia is at one or the other state uh, and one or the other severity not complying with. But you can see that how it is not so complying, how it is framing its own argument, that it does not see a military necessity out of its own military thinking for these arms control treaties. It perceives itself an a relative advantage on the eastern flank that it can exploit to, uh, for political gains and that it does not want to sacrifice this military advantage uh, for the time being. So if Russian considerations are predominantly driven by military strategic considerations, we can of course influence these considerations by changing the military strategic operative tactic situation on the ground. It's the easiest task. We did that multiple times during the Cold War. We just have to revert back to this logic. Um, just another thing about uh, sort of US and is it up to the Europeans? Uh, the, the, the thing is, uh, now uh, the, 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 the main effect of these weapons is in crisis to split the alliance by dedicatedly put Western Europe and Europe as such at risk, but not the Americans, hoping that this at the time and given the sort of the, the Russian influence on public debate would dissuade any American or any quick American responses to a crisis that the Russians perceive necessary of winning. Uh, and, and that for us is dangerous. And here now we are all basically in the same situation Helmut Schmidt was in, in the early 70s. And it's very tricky to get out of that. Uh, um, and, and yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gustav. And, and back to, to Rina and uh, the question, uh, not only about the INF, of course, but also about the general uh, threat and security perception in, in Estonia. Because uh, Estonia is, you know, because of the geographical location is clearly very vulnerable. And uh, so w what would be very interesting uh, is to hear how you perceive also not only the INF debate, but also the, the, f the f uh, question of further enhancement of uh, alliance presence at the eastern flank and especially in Estonia. Yes, thank you, Piotr. Um, well, um, first of all, I'm not uh, an arms control expert, but I can speak uh, in more general terms about this. Um, Estonia was one of these countries, together with the other Baltic states and Poland, who did not necessarily harshly criticize the US for, for doing this. And, uh, well, we did not support the withdrawal from INF, but we uh, supported them in a discussion or agreement that Russia violated the treaty. And this was the main point. Um, when it comes to to the overall perception, then of course, uh, I mean, Estonia is very concerned for, uh, for this treaty collapsing. But I just, uh, last week uh, I was at a conference in New Delhi where a retired Russian general said that that actually the problem of the U.S. is that uh, we have we have these I mean nukes and they don't and uh, and we are not going to get rid of them because this is such a crucial part of our deterrence so they can only wish for that and this also means the collapse of INF and maybe also the the next uh, START treaty uh, but uh, but for Estonia well um, is one of the INF is one of the two still standing pillars of the arms control regime created during the Cold War. And uh, now when this is destroyed, or okay, I, I accept that it's, it's not all over yet, 
but uh, but there will be no legal restrictions on, on regional nuclear arms ration in Europe and in East Asia, of course. And, uh, and this is worrisome, especially when you think of our geographical position and the force posture on both sides. Then, I mean, there are 400,000 troops on the Russian side and only 200,000 on, on, on the Western side. Um, and plus we are in, in Kaliningrad range, so we are actually a target of, of all this. So for, for us, uh, NATO's role in the region is of paramount importance and the sort of cohesive approach of NATO. Of course, we would like to have permanent presence of, of US troops on the ground, but this is, uh, it is a very difficult question and it's a very complicated question, and especially now when, when Poland is discussing this bilateral arrangement with the US and the so-called fault for Trump. But, uh, but we are very happy about the current uh, enhanced forward presence that we got after the Warsaw summit. So in that sense, uh, yes, we are trying to get engaged in every initiative still. We try to keep NATO together. We try to keep our voice heard as we are the most vulnerable link of NATO. And uh, and I think that, that uh, we should but Estonia is a little bit afraid, I think, of any a kind of backdoor solution or any bilateral uh, initiative that we don't really know where it is heading us and uh, whether there is a threat of, of dividing uh, NATO. Because, I mean, this is as the Norwegian foreign minister said, that this political unity is much more important than military capabilities at the end of the day. Panie ministrze, ja, ja chciałem nawiązać do tego do ostatniego cytatu. Minister, I would like to refer to the quote uh, by Irina Kaljurand because two Polish initiatives uh, uh, have been very controversial uh, in these days. Uh, one of them is uh, what's being discussed as Fort Trump and the other is the conference uh, on uh, Middle East in February, which by many commentators are perceived as unfavorable to the unity of uh, um, North Atlantic Alliance when it comes to uh, for Trump, as it is a bilateral uh, initiative, or uh, to uh, the European unity, because this conference is perceived as favorable to the American interpretative line when it comes to nuclear um, agreement with uh, Iran and the uh, European Union uh, as a whole has a different opinion on that uh, than uh, the administration of the USA. So I would like to ask you to comment on this criticism. Well, it's difficult for me to generalize uh, critical voices because there are always people who are not happy with some things but on the other hand we've got much support and high expectations as uh, far as both initiatives are concerned we started a d debate by um, talking about whether united states uh, are a reliable ally and then we ask uh, why do americans send troops to europe we need to make a decision. Either we need and want Americans to be present in Europe as a pillar of our security and that's what uh, Polish-American uh, talks uh, are for, uh, just as was the case uh, uh, with bilateral discussions between, for instance, Italy and the United States. Secondly, at the beginning, we said that uh, Trump's administration uh, is not multilateral, but unilateral. And then we organize a conference and ask, invite lots of countries to take a multilateral position. And we can hear criticism that we invite so many parties to the conference. So on the one hand, 
we want more multilateralism, but on the other hand, we are not happy with the initiatives taken. Well, we are not one issue country in Poland. The Middle East is a region where which has not been uh, that important uh, from the perspective of uh, history. Of course, we are interested in the region, but strategically, from the perspective of Poland, uh, I'm not talking in beha on behalf of Estonia or Austria, but for us in Poland, uh, the most important threat, uh, threat is transatlantic divide. And the reason uh, why we agreed to host the conference was to reduce the divide or even to dig it somewhere down uh, uh, beneath uh, the ground. There is no common unilateral European stance or position. We support uh, J JPCOA, but we are against uh, some counterproductive uh, proposals uh, that aim at undermining US politics even though we have not tried to make an agreement with the US government yet. And I think that we would like to have a final solution as to the military uh, presence of the United States, extended military presence of the USA in Poland it will have a regional nature, that's our attitude. But this will give rise to lots of controversy and we are well accustomed to it. Uh, we've got uh, Nord Stream and lots of controversy around it, uh, despite uh, the fact that there are many voices in the EU against the project. It is being implemented. Uh, multi-annual financial framework, for instance, is also heatedly debated. And INF, from the perspective of uh, Central Eastern Europe, is uh, not that important. Uh, and I think that uh, after the agreement is reached between Poland and the United States, uh, we will have a positive uh, view. Will uh, an enhanced uh, American military presence in the form of uh, for Trump in Poland strengthen uh, the security in Central Eastern Europe or Central Europe, including Germany, um, or do you have a different view? And uh, the second question, will Minister Maas participate in the conference, uh, in the Middle East conference in um, February and uh, contribute to the to the solution to the to bridging the gap between uh, the transatlantic and uh, European views on Iran let me answer the the, the second question first uh, Minister Maas has not uh, made up his mind on whether he will participate in this conference I mean we still have uh, a couple of weeks to go uh, we have received a number of uh, information about this about this conference mm, we still have we still have questions about the conference uh, we are in the process of discussing these both with our Polish and with our American friends uh, we'll see um, the danger of course is here uh, that there is a split um, in Europe mrs. Mogherini does not seem to be particularly enthusiastic about the initiative there is a there is a danger of um, specifically with respect to Iran, uh, where the U.S. policy and the European policy uh, is not completely on the same page, to say the least. Let me remind, by the way, all those who who, who criticize um, the the JCPOA that the JCPOA has been adopted by a, by a, a resolution of the Security Council of the United Nations. So it's not just some agreement, it's, a, it's an internationally accepted, endorsed by, by the Security Council of the United Nations. So um, the question is, um, since Iran is, is uh, apparently not invited to this conference, 
what will that mean? Also the question, what does it mean uh, for, the, um, for the peace process? As uh, all of you know, the American uh, ideas concerning the peace process are not necessarily the same as the European ones. So um, there, is a, there is a danger of, um, of disunity. And, but uh, as I said, we, d these are questions that we are discussing with our, with our friends and, and we'll make up our minds together, I would say, with the other uh, partners, specifically the E3, uh, on, this, on this specific issue. Uh, with respect to the, uh, to the other question, uh, I would say the essential reinforcement of troops in, 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 in Eastern Europe, specifically for, for Trump permanent stationing. First of all, uh, I'm not so sure that the U.S. Uh, position, the, the U.S. decision on this issue will be as forthcoming as some in the, in the Polish government expect or hope. Uh, secondly, the essential question is, will more troops in this part of, of Europe increase security or not? What will be the Russian reaction to that? Maybe, will we, maybe we see uh, Russian ground troops in Belarus. Will then, will then the security in, in Central Europe be, be better than, than without it? I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a serious question that, that all of us have to ask. Of course, every country has its, has its own position on that. And, we, and obviously, this has to be and is discussed, is discussed in nature. I'm not talking about the, about the NATO-Russia founding act in this, uh, in this context. But is it, really, is it really more security? After all, it's a tripwire presence anyway, only. You will never have as much, as much conventional troops here in order to address the, the imbalance with the conventional balance with, with Russia. So it's a tripwire presence, maybe a more important tripwire presence. And does it, in, does it increase security or not? That's the, that's the question. That's the question, and perhaps uh, Rina has an answer. Uh. Oh, I, I certainly do. <laughs> um, well, yes, this is a good question. Um, from our perspective, I think more U.S. troops in this part of Europe would be a good solution, uh, because we need to deter Russia. We need to speak uh, the language Russians understand and for them, the military might is the only language they understand in this part of the world. Uh, whether this will be for Trump or we, we don't even know, I mean, whether or which format this will be or end up. But uh, if this is a regional format, which also sort of, even if we don't get permanent American troops in the Baltic states and we could use troops stationed here in Poland, this would be a big step further. But it doesn't mean that uh, that we don't have to uh, take more care of our own defense and raise our defense budgets and on also cooperate within the European Union, within all these defense initiatives. Because as we just uh, ended these um, two sessions during the day, I mean, this question whether or rather statements that uh, on the one hand that we cannot do without US uh, still uh, but the US will probably move away from Europe anyway at some point so it's um, two, two sides of the same coin really. Thank you, thank you Rina and uh, Gustav uh, has a comment. <laughs> uh, just 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 a two finger. Uh, during the Cold War, the Germans and Italians were uh, happy about every American tank on their soil. So um, I can understand your feeling uh, uh, that you want American presence on the ground. And yes, it's important. Uh, the, the thing is, it always depends on how you do it. Um, the first thing is how to address it when U.S. domestic political debate is enormously divided. Uh, and you address it as a personal offer to, to, to one of the figures that might not be around there very long. The second thing is, 
Uh, back then also sort of the status of forces agreement were bilateral. There was integrated NATO force planning at the time of the Cold War. And all American and all other internationally deployed troops in Germany and in Italy and in Turkey and in Greece were part of an integrated force planning. Um, the Americans uh, are, of course, the most important uh, fighting force in NATO. But throughout the history of the Cold War, uh, there were always capabilities that the Americans were not developing and that were sort of joined in by other allies. So be open-minded uh, and make it subject to NATO integrated force planning. Uh, make it flexible to join for other nations. We will have a Britain that after all, uh, I hope that this Brexit nonsense goes away, but if it doesn't go away, that will redefine its Europe policy in one way or the other, security policy being one of that. Be open-minded to that, be open-minded to uh, to this cooperation and, and don't limit the offers to one, one president. Thank you very much, Gustav. And uh, we have 15 minutes left and we will have to uh, finish at 6.30 sharp. But now there's time for you, for, for your questions, comments, Ambassador here in the first row. I'm, I'm Aldo Marti, the Italian Ambassador here in Warsaw. I wanted, I wanted to ask you to talk a bit about security, you know, because, of course, INF Treaty is very important. Uh, some, he mentioned also, you know, the, the conversation that the Italian authority has with the Americans, of course, mainly about Libya in our case. But the point is that uh, if you look at our societies and if you look at the trade war, Already, the trade war is doing in terms of security on our citizens much more damages than any other things. If you look numbers, I was watching last night a very interesting uh, broadcast on BBC. It's saying that we're talking about 500 billion uh, dollars already done in damage. So, if you look at the division of our societies, I'm talking about different countries in, uh, in Europe. So because of the, some attitudes uh, coming from the other side of the Atlantic. For Putin, it just is a party every day, you know, watching uh, what's happening in Europe uh, right now. So uh, I, don't see, I don't see, I mean, in terms of uh, urgency. So I was just wondering what you think about whether in two years' time we're going to have more problems for our security, internal security, uh, we saw what happened with, the, for instance, with the refugee problem, with the migration problem. So what, that was enough to divide us. Or Russia is considered by public opinion and at the end, you know, social media and politicians more important issues in terms of security. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, Ovid Drang, Ambassador of Romania to Poland. Thank you very much to all panelists for, uh, for their contribution to this de debate. I would have two questions. Uh, uh, France and Germany signed today or yesterday today a treaty uh, in Aachen and I'd uh, like to, to ask all panelists how do they see the contribution of this treaty to um, European security, if there is any at this moment, if you can assess that contribution at this moment. And secondly, uh, uh, do you see any merit uh, in a uh, cooperation, a platform between Romania, Poland, France, and Germany aimed at um, um, providing uh, uh, increased level of legitimacy and representativity to, the, uh, uh, to uh, any um, initiative aimed at consolidating the European project. This discussion is very much focused on NATO and the relations between the US and NATO. And I would like to get back to the European Union it is extremely important uh, for the security of the region and I would like to ask the panelists how they assess the politics of Trump's administration towards the EU, bearing in mind that uh, President Trump supported Brexit very much and treats the EU as, well, maybe not uh, uh, a hostile force, uh, but a uh, uh, an economic competitor. So what's the attitude of Trump's administration towards the EU? I uh, lived in, in France in the uh, late 70s and I remember the discussion about the uh, state secrets. Um, there were some anxieties, they are not guarded properly. 
And uh, in the middle of this discussion, there was a public opinion poll uh, uh, telling that in case of the Russian aggression, 72% of uh, the French people will not fight because it, as the old proverb said, it, it is better to be red than dead. Uh, uh, I, uh, I picked up what uh, our Austrian colleague uh, said about the information war. Are we really, you think, prepared in the NATO countries to do anything about it since you told us that the narrative is so much important? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will get back to the panel, perhaps in the reversed order, if you don't mind, starting with Ustav. Are we ready for the info war? Um, now that I'm in Berlin since 2014, no, unfortunately. Uh, uh, it depends on the very, I think the Baltic countries are further than we are, but in Central Europe, we are still starting only, or in Germany at least, they're only starting to get ready for it. On you, uh, yes, uh, I mean, the thing is, about which establishment are we talking? Trump, Trump's personal hostility towards the EU is particularly problematic because uh, for Germans, it strikes at the core issue of their identity. Um, having built up the EU is something like sort of the replacement of an identity uh, of, for, for the national state identity in Germany. So it's something very peculiar and very dangerous. Fortunately, in the past, Trump's in bad instincts were tamed by adults. Uh, the problem is they're getting fewer and fewer. The Aachen Treaty, um, the thing is there have been a lot of announcements and the problem with Europeans and with Germans in particular is not to announce the right thing but to live up to the announcement. Uh, in, in theory, sort of uh, the German-French German cooperation could deliver a lot. Uh, we'll have to see for the praxis and for example if, if you touch Romania and Black Sea security uh, by discussing the Baltics up and down, we forget about uh, the, the other uh, dire military situation. Uh, for example, Romania signed up uh, to, uh, to the framework nation concept with Germany, uh, and we have yet failed to deliver uh, as one exercise uh, in Romania or a reinforcement exercise like, like those holding, uh, hosted in the Baltic countries in the Black Sea. Uh, so, so uh, the paperwork is okay, uh, but unless we exercise and deliver and do things, um, the paperwork will not be enough. Thank you, Gustav Rina. You can pick up questions you like. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I will then start with internal security and uh, internal divisions within the European countries, as I understood your question correctly. Indeed, there has been this sort of divide between uh, Central Eastern European countries and uh, Southern uh, European countries when it comes to migration, for example, and our sort of unwillingness to, to fulfill our part of, of the obligation. But I think that this is, um, first of all, the situation is probably not that bad, at least not in Estonia, because we are at least discussing this now more and more. Plus, I think this was a very much a communication problem. Then, um, also from Commission side and, and, and this quota, but, but you're right that all these sort of, our, the questions of Eurozone or free trade or migration or Brexit, all these questions are taking up unnecessarily much of our energy and we don't have time to, to solve bigger problems or even to keep a close eye on what is happening in our neighborhood and especially in the southern neighborhood or, or in Asia for that matter. Uh, well, when it comes to German-French um, agreement, then I... I would only say I, I agree with Gustav that it could have been a little bit more precise, concrete, with concrete proposals. But also, well, from Estonian perspective, I would say that that we definitely need that kind of leadership in Europe. 
whether this is good enough is another question. But also this sort of leadership should amount uh, the opinions of the other member states. We don't want to get suffocated in, in all this leadership thing. Uh, well, and, and indeed, information war, I think that, that in the Baltic states we have faced these hybrid threats for 25 years, so I think we can do with non-military threats, another thing is military threats. Yes, interesting questions, all of them. Uh, Aldo, um, yes, uh, there are these problems, obviously, and these problems are very important. And maybe in a couple of years, those problems uh, will be more important uh, than, than, than the security problems in the strict sense of the word. But that's a little bit beside the point, to be frank, I think. Because when we talk about security, we're talking about the indivisibility of security. And indivisibility of security, in my view, means that all of us should watch and, and be prepared to, to contribute to uh, security in Eastern Europe, or sorry, in Central, Central and Eastern Europe, as well as all the others should contribute to the kind of security problems or other problems that arise more in other parts of the, uh, other parts of the European Union. So we have to stick together, all of us, on all the problems. That's, that's the indiv indivisibility of security. Second point, Ovidio, on the Treaty of Aachen. Um, it's, a, it's a very important treaty. It contributes to security in a sense that um, seven out of uh, 27 articles of the treaty uh, are, are uh, dealing with this. With this. Uh, it's about uh, working together to, to increase the industrial base uh, in, in Europe. And that is, of course, uh, in by no means exclusive. I mean, others, others, are, others are invited to participate. Uh, secondly, it's about uh, cooperation uh, in the United Nations Security Council. Again, that's not Germany and Poland, uh, sorry, Germany and France alone. Poland is a member of the UN Security Council, and obviously uh, it is important that all European countries uh, contribute to uh, to to uh, to cohesion in in, the, in this instance. Um, it's also, and I, I want to stress that it has uh, it has a connotation, and it mentions Article Five uh, of the NATO Treaty and Article Forty Two um, Seven uh, of the Lisbon Treaty. So it is it has also this this implication of reinforcing our security by closely, closely cooperating. So um, it, is, it is important in this, in this respect, but it's by no means exclusive. And in any case, we think that, the, that, this, that this new treaty uh, can show us, show the way in Europe as one of the contributions to advance together on the common challenges that we face. And we think that Europe should be, should be united on these issues and France and Germany are proposing a way forward. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the only way forward, but it's a way forward. And others who, 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 are, who want to contribute to that can now say, okay, we want to be with France and Germany or not, and then, and then propose other, other things. So it's a, it's, a, it's a proposal, not more than that. Uh, and by the way, uh, it will be, uh, and, and, this is, and this is correct in this, in this context, it will be determined more concretely by uh, regular decisions of the, of the uh, Franco-German Ministerial Council who will decide on con very concrete projects. Uh, second question, Ovidio, on, on Romania, uh, Poland, France and Germany consolidating, consolidating European project. I think there are, there are uh, in fact, uh, mentioned uh, certain things here, and I think it's 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 up to Romania also to make to make proposals uh, what uh, what could what could be done. We are we are open in in this respect. We want to keep Europe together as much as we can, and so we are open to proposals from others, like we were open to the Polish proposal of a three me a three seas initiative. We are now not not completely part of it, but 
let's say, half part of it, right? <laughs> okay, but anyway, we were, we were open, we were open to this, to this initiatives. Um, Minister Onishkevich, you, you touched on a very, very serious point. Uh, the economic differences that we have with the US uh, uh, under Trump are very important. Here we're talking about uh, a real issue, a, pr a real bread and butter issue. If Trump, or if the if the all the attempts to avoid a trade war will not be are not successful, then we will have serious. And he and Trump implements the uh, tariffs on the um, uh, on on the motor industry. This will be very serious for Europe, including for including for Germany and Poland, which are closely intertwined in this in this respect. And all the all the other issues uh, can be can be also quite complicated. Well, the Iran issue, uh, uh, three um, uh, third party sanctions. You know, all all this is is very. And I'm I'm worried about the future of this uh, of this issue more than than about the, the present. Okay, and uh, just one comment on the on the French opinion polls. What did Churchill say? Or oh, somebody say? Was it Churchill? I only believe the polls that I falsified myself, right? Krutko is a a short comment, maybe <clears throat> as regards the enforcement of the presence of the American troops in Poland. I think that um, John Wayne is long gone and the Fort Trump is not going to be a real fort. <clears throat> Whether we like it or not, the public imagination is driven by social media, by headlines. Few people read anything else but headlines, so we just needed a phrase that would attract attention. So we don't mean it <clears throat> to be a real fort. This is just a slogan. It's not just about mm, troops. This is also about equipment. And we are talking <clears throat> about the details with the US. We are working on the final draft of the agreement. And I think that not all members of the Polish government will be uh, happy. <clears throat> but I believe there might be some surprises as well. As regards the reaction of Russia in Belarus, well, let's face it, we already have fought Putin in three places, in Kaliningrad, in Syria, and in Crimea. So let's take the reality as it is. If we think that we will be safe if we do not react, I think this is a mistake. We will not be safe if we do not react, because right now Russia is able to perform <clears throat> a military operation at a very fast pace and the Russian missiles can reach us within a minute. So we need to react and whatever we agree on with the US will be compliant with the NATO agreement. It will be transparent and we keep informing our allies on what we are working on. So I see no reason to be concerned for our allies. And what the Italian ambassador was talking about is very important. But also what the what Ambassador Nike was talking about is very important. We also see the issue of security as something that has 360 degrees. Uh, we understand that there are special forces, special Polish forces in Sicily, for example, operating on an Italian platform. We're also talking with friends about a similar action. There is no outcome, final outcome yet, but we might have um, some action there with the cooperation with friends in the Mediterranean with the aim to stabilize um, Libya. We are present in Afghanistan, in Iraq, so Poland is a 360 degrees um, security country, so we need to see security as a whole. We need to show solidarity in this. And the economy is very important as well, of course. I have not mentioned it before. For Central Europe, it is of crucial importance that we have an economic boom, uh, we have a major economic growth, uh, we are talking about an, a growth of 10% in Poland. This opens new possibilities for us, also with regard to the 3C initiative, something that was mentioned by uh, Ambassador Nickel. 
And now to answer the question posed by Mr. Onishkevich, of course we can keep complaining about um, Trump, but we'd rather get Mr. Trump involved in the European economy. After the <coughs> Bucharest summit, we've got very precise and concrete decisions <coughs> as regards the involvement of the uh, EUS uh, in the infrastructure of the three uh, C's uh, initiative. This is a completely new situation. Following the trump Juncker summit, we already know that the aim of <coughs> President Trump is not to block the trade, the transatlantic trade, but to liberalize it. <clears throat> but right now, Mr. Trump just found himself in a situation uh, in which uh, he felt um, a necessity to uh, to to use a threat because there was no further way for him to make a progress in the negotiations. As far as the Aachen Treaty is concerned, well, it is very difficult to assess it right now because we don't know how it will be implemented. And this is a crucial <coughs> question whether we keep developing as a club of 27 member states or maybe there will be smaller clubs within the community. And Poland itself is trying to uh, develop the... Um, cooperation between Germany and France. And we are also getting involved in many economic projects um, together with Germany and France. Unfortunately, as for Romania, I do not have good news. The consolidation of the European <coughs> project, well, you don't have much time left because the European elections are coming soon, <coughs> so your presidency will be shorter effectively <clears throat> there is brexit coming and there is the Nord Stream issue so it is a big question whether you will have the courage to raise the Nord Stream uh, issue as a political issue because right now it is treated as a merely political issue and now it is a question whether Romania will have the courage to raise it as a political issue not just a legal issue and uh, also um, coupling uh, the European funds with the observation of the rule of law. This is another area in which decisions need to be made right now, which is very difficult indeed. And now the question, is it better to be red than that or the other way around? Well, what we are doing together with the US or with Germany within the European Union or with Estonia, with the Baltic states, <clears throat> well, our aim is not to have to answer that question whether it is better to be dead than red or the other way around. I can only recommend uh, reading essays by Mr. Griegel. He was an American of Polish origin and he wrote a short essay <clears throat> in which he said the following thing. How to normalize the relations with Russia. That's the title of the essay he wrote. And his only answer was to convince Russia that the geopolitical order cannot be changed. So we need to make sure that Russia understands that it cannot blackmail, that it cannot bribe, it cannot use force to rearrange the geopolitical order in Europe. which is a result of negotiations between us and Russians, Russia, of course, after um, the Cold War. Of course, we are open for negotiations with Russia, but we cannot be blackmailed and threatened. Thank you, Minister. Oh, thank you for your attention. I do not have the courage to sum up the discussion, but we've been talking a lot about risks and threats. And when we are having such a debate, we often say that it is a great risk to have diplomats involved in the discussion because you always have this threat of, or this risk of falling asleep if you have diplomats on stage involved in the debate. But this time, well, it was not like that. We've had a very vivid debate and no one fell asleep. So thank you a lot. I'd like to extend my thanks to Mr. Gressel, to Mr. Chichotsky, to Mr. Nickel and to Miss mm. uh, Kalurant, thank you for your questions and uh, we look forward to further debates organized.